Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. At the dawn of the 20th century, the world was in the grip of a pirate frenzy. Now, this wasn't real-world pirates. The only real pirates of any note were German submariners, and that was a different problem all its own. No, it was the mythology of pirates, the romance and the legend of pirates that held the world in thrall. Now, this all began back in 1883 when a virtually unknown Scottish author named Robert Louis Stevenson published his book Treasure Island. It was a sudden and massive success. In a lot of ways, the publication of Treasure Island is very similar to that of Harry Potter. Both were massively popular, and both owed their success in large part to the readership of children. And then, both of them led to a sort of cultural renaissance. In the case of Harry Potter, it was the popularization of fantasy fiction, and perhaps more importantly, it was kind of the catalyst for the entire young adult genre. You see, Harry Potter was written for children, but it was written honestly. It has themes that are truthful about what it's like to grow up. They express all of the joy and all of the wonder, as well as the confusion and the frustration and the fear. And in a lot of ways, Treasure Island was similar. It was written from the point of view of a young boy, and it encapsulated something real about being a child. In the case of Treasure Island, more exactly, it encapsulated something true about being a boy in English society. And more than anything else, what it expressed was a desire to be free. Both in the sense of experiencing dangerous adventure, but also to be accepted as an adult. It spoke to boys of about ten back then, much the same way it did to me when my next-door neighbor gave me a copy of Treasure Island for my tenth birthday. And in the case of both Harry Potter and Treasure Island, the rest of the world scurried to capitalize on that success. There were other works of literary fiction involving pirates like The Black Corsair and Captain Blood, but then there were all the plays and movies. In 1904, J. M. Barrie produced Peter Pan, or The Boy Who Wouldn't Grow Up, for the stage, and in 1911 he published Peter Pan and Wendy, the book version of that story. In both of those, the standout character was Peter's nemesis, Captain Hook. Barrie wrote in Captain Hook that the old sea cook, which was an allusion to Long John Silver, was only ever afraid of one man, Captain James Hook. In much the same way, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote that the only man Blackbeard ever feared was Captain Flint. This was a beautiful series of one-upmanship. If Blackbeard, who was a real-world pirate, was only ever afraid of Captain Flint, and Flint was only ever afraid of his quartermaster, Long John Silver, as Stevenson wrote, and Long John Silver was only ever afraid of Captain Hook, well, then Hook must truly have been a terrifying pirate indeed. And then, then there were the movies. There was Lunaire de Corsair in 1908. That is a very early piece of cinema involving pirates. And that was followed by The Pirate's Gold and Morgan Le Pirate and Blackbeard, Treasure Island and Pirate Gold. And all of that was before the outbreak of World War I in 1914. If we extend that six years to 1920, we see movies like The Footsteps of Captain Kidd, On the Spanish Main, and Pirate Haunts, as well as Another Treasure Island, The Sea Panther, Another Pirate Gold, Yet Another Treasure Island, and finally, The Black Corsair. Now, believe it or not, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, today's episode isn't about pirates and popular culture. I will be talking about that in the future, but not today. Instead, I just wanted to illustrate how pirate crazy the world was in the late 19th and early 20th century. With all of this rush to publish and produce pirate content, the world saw basically every old dusty pirate book it could find pulled off the shelves and reprinted. Without Robert Louis Stevenson and the success of his book Treasure Island, the subsequent reprinting of these manuscripts may never have been done, and those manuscripts might have been lost in the turmoil of those two world wars. There was Robinson Crusoe, which was reprinted. There was a general history of the robberies and murders of the most notorious pirates. There was the pirate's own book and many, many others. But there are four in particular which concern us today. In 1898, a London publishing house chose to capitalize on this pirate craze by reprinting two entirely separate manuscripts in a single volume. It was entitled The Buccaneers of America, 1898-1900. 
a true account of the most remarkable assaults committed of late years upon the coasts of the West Indies by the buccaneers of Jamaica and Tortuga, both English and French, wherein are contained more especially the unparalleled exploits of Sir Henry Morgan, our English Jamaican hero who sacked Portobello, burnt Panama, etc., by John Esquemelin, one of the buccaneers who was present at those tragedies. This was a reprint of Alexander Esquemelin's account, poorly translated and often incorrect but still valuable to us. Then, just sort of tacked on to the end there, they added a modified version of the diary of a man named Basil Ringrose. He was a pirate who was involved on the voyage that concerns us today. And it's lucky for us that they did reprint that, as that may be our best account of what actually occurred on that voyage. There was, of course, Dampier's account, William Dampier. His, uh, his book was called A New Voyage Round the World, and it was also republished around this time. It is an invaluable source, but it's so much more concerned with the customs of local peoples and the natural world than chronicling the exploits of the pirates. But then, finally, republished in 1903, was the journal of a man named Lionel Wafer, A New Voyage and Descriptions of the Isthmus of America. He was only with the voyage for a limited time, but his writings help us to create a bigger and more vivid picture of just what happened on that voyage. So I'd like to begin today with a quote from the introduction to that 1903 version by George Parker Winship. Quote, English and French and New Englanders, with Dutch and Moors and Native Americans, the pick of the ne'er-do-wells of all the world, climbed the mountain paths and floated downstream into the South Seas, to fight or to drown, to gamble and gorge or perish of thirst, for the sake of winning the gold demanded by the harlots and wine sellers of Kingstown and Petit Guave. Great as are the gains of piracy, they must always be less than the ultimate profits of legitimate trade, and so the unyielding laws of human affairs decreed that the buccaneers must disappear. The country through which they passed remains today much as they left it two hundred years ago. The missionary priests have taken the place of the Pawas, and by the service of the Mass is gradually leading their widely scattered flocks toward European ways of living and thinking. But the mountain passes remain as steep as of old, and the torrents flood the valleys with the same overwhelming expectedness, and the savannas as fruitful as when Wafer saw them. End quote. This is episode 39, Ne'er-Do-Wells of All the World. December 1679 was an auspicious month for the buccaneers of the Americas. Every captain of note in the region was involved in a conspiracy. They were attempting to plan something big and to keep it quiet. They were sending messengers to all the known pirate haunts in the West Indies, to Port Royal and Tortuga, to Petit Guave, and all of the logwood camps along the Mosquito Coast and Terminios Lagoon. They were sending men even as far as Puerto Rico and Barbados and St. Lucia and Martinique. It's likely even that they sent men to that backwater port of Nassau on New Providence Island in the Bahamas. See, at the time, they were recruiting. Anyone who had a ship and a crew of miscreants willing to risk their lives was welcome to join up. They had to get the word out there, but they had to keep it quiet, and mostly they were successful at that. John Coxon was successful in recruiting a number of pirates, and he had men like Captain Hobby ferrying willing men out into out-of-the-way places like Negril Bay to join his fleet. Captains like Lesson and Edmund Cook may have heard of this voyage and sailed on ahead to join up. But some captains were less lucky. Richard Sawkins was sailing around the coasts of Jamaica searching for any likely ships to join his cause. He'd been a close associate and partner to John Coxon on more than a few of their missions. They likely worked together on that raid on Santa Marta in 1677, and almost certainly were both involved in the raid on the Bay of Honduras only a few months earlier in September 1679 and he and Coxon were working together on this next raid, this planned attack on Portobello, but Sawkins was about to have a bit of bad fortune befall him. Another pirate, an associate of both Sawkins and Coxon, a man named Captain Peter Harris, was working out of the South Keys of Cuba. He was recruiting and hunting some Spanish ships along the way. 
The Jamaican governor, Lord Carlisle, heard about this and sent out a ship, the HMS Success, to capture Captain Harris. The Success was a 24-gun, sixth-rate ship of the line. Not the sort of warship to have pictures painted and stories written in her honor, but a well-armed and well-maintained warship nonetheless, and more than enough to threaten any of these pirate sloops and brigantines. Carlyle probably delegated this job to his lieutenant governor, Henry Morgan. Now, Morgan's primary role in Jamaica was to deal with the problem of piracy out of Port Royal, and actually, under Lord Carlyle, he'd become pretty good at it. On the way to capture Captain Harris, however, the HMS Success stumbled across Captain Sawkins in his brigantine. Captain Thomas Johnson, of the Success, knew the reputation of Sawkins well and captured him under suspicion of high seas piracy. Now, Captain Johnson ordered Sawkins' crew to be put in chains, and then he allocated a skeleton crew from the success to sail Sawkins' brig to Port Royal, where the pirates would face justice. Then Johnson, in the success, sailed on her way to Cuba to continue her mission to capture Captain Harris. When the brigantine arrived in Port Royal, they were met by the provost marshal, and perhaps even Henry Morgan was there, and the pirates were marched off. Now, right about this time, off to the west in Jamaica, William Dampier was meeting with Captain Coxon and his buccaneer fleet, like we discussed on the last show. The crew of Captain Hobby was agreeing to join up with the pirates, and we can assume that the pirate captains who were there, Coxon and Sharp and Allison, well, that they were probably worried about Sawkins' failure to arrive at this rendezvous. Nonetheless, though, they went on ahead and sailed for the Spanish Main. Now, Sawkins and his men, back in Port Royal, had lost their ship. The brigantine was impounded by the Jamaican government and was being refitted to enter service into the Jamaican Navy. Now, the pirates were forced to wait, under guard and in chains, for the Admiralty Court to convene. The court was the only body with real jurisdiction over any of these matters at sea, and they only convened every so often. Usually, they had to wait for Lieutenant Governor Morgan to get sober and actually show up. So, Sawkins and his crew whiled away their days eating gruel and relieving themselves in the corner of the cell and waiting for news to come down that they were to be hung by the neck until dead. But then... Then some news arrived in Port Royal. The success, the ship that was going after Captain Harris had run aground off the south coast of Cuba, and the brigantine that had formerly belonged to Sawkins was being fitted and supplied to rescue the crew of the success. Now, it's unclear, at least in the records I've seen, what exactly happened next. We can assume that about 40 men were preparing the brig to sail. We know that they would have been filling water casks and loading foodstuffs and bringing on board powder and shot for their guns, likely even loading a few new guns onto the vessel, as well as all of the routine maintenance, getting the ship ready to sail. We do know that they set out for Cuba quickly, to rescue the crew of the success and to prevent a potential international incident. It would look pretty bad if the Spanish government found an English warship crashed off of their coast. However, if the Jamaican government uh, knew that there was a pirate fleet under Captain Coxon currently attacking Portobello, well, that looked a lot worse. But they didn't know that, so they sent the ship out to rescue the crew of the success. Now, it's possible that the guard on the pirate crew of Richard Sawkins was light, Perhaps only one or two men at any time, maybe even less, especially at night time. You see, it's possible that with the guards so light, there were a few men from town able to sneak into the magistrate's office, or maybe in Fort Charles, wherever the pirates were being kept, that could come up on the guards unaware. If there were any guards, it was late at night, and these guards might even be sleeping. Now, it would have been easy with just a few men to club those guards over the head or slit their throats or even just hold them at sword point. Two or three determined pirates could have gotten the keys and released Sawkins and his men with very little trouble. Of course, after that event, they would have been wanted men in Port Royal, but a few months away and a fake name later and they'd have nothing to worry about. What we do know is that Captain Sawkins and his men escaped. Sawkins, quote, made his escape in a wary 
end quote, and headed out to sea in pursuit of his brigantine. It wouldn't take him long, though. His brig sat becalmed only a few leagues offshore. The pirates were old hands at taking ships from their rowboats with only a few men in the dead of night, and this didn't prove all that difficult for them. Now, they may have been spotted, but rowing silently without any light wasn't an issue for them, and they likely got to the ship unseen. Now, ships in the age of sail were never truly quiet. All of the men worked in shifts, and at night there might be just as many men about as during the day. But when a ship is becalmed and in waters so close to their own home port, well, many were probably taking their ease. A dozen men boarding this ship could take it if they did so quietly, and Sawkins had more than twice that. So in the morning, Sawkins was back in command of his brigantine with 36 men under him. The Navy had been kind enough to stock his ship with food and water and supplies, as well as do a little bit of fixing up on the ship, and Captain Sawkins was able to sail away for the South Keys of Cuba to meet with his friend, Captain Harris. Now, Harris was an old hand at the buccaneering trade. He'd actually sailed with Henry Morgan on several of his voyages. He'd even led men to take Panama. During the war with the Dutch, he'd taken on a French commission and done quite well at it. Now, he wasn't a flashy commander. He rarely led shore-bound excursions or raids on cities, but at sea, he was one of the best. He'd made an art of coming upon unsuspecting ships and boarding them, taking anything of value and disappearing into the mists. In the Keys, he'd done much that same thing, and then when the success arrived to capture or kill Captain Harris, he set sail. Now, these South Keys could be shallow and rocky. They were dangerous to ships whose masters didn't know the waters well, but Harris did know these waters well. Captain Johnson of the success didn't. It was during this chase after Harris that the success ran aground with an irreparable hole in her hull, and once again... Captain Harris sailed away unscathed. Sawkins, for his part, was having less good fortune. He ran afoul of a Spanish warship on his way to meet Captain Harris and was forced into a firefight. Now, it's disputed whether or not he was trying to take the ship at the time. Perhaps the Spanish ship just attacked him, or perhaps not, but either way, the result wasn't good for Sawkins and his men. There was a fierce firefight, and ten men died before Sawkins was able to make his escape. And then he was forced to return to Jamaica to bury his men, and probably to recruit a few men to replace them. While his ship was anchored offshore, Sawkins was spotted by another English vessel, the HMS Hunter. Now the Hunter was a 28-gun ship that patrolled the waters around Jamaica hunting buccaneers, hence the name. So the hunter sent a pinnace over to investigate that unfamiliar ship at anchor, and Sawkins responded. He fired upon the pinnace when it drew close with a volley of small shot which would have ripped through any of the men on board the pinnace with ease. Now the hunter itself didn't have a shallow enough draft to approach Sawkins as close to the shore as he was, but she was accompanied by a sloop that sailed forward to engage the pirate. So Sawkins urged his men to prepare his ship to sail, but they were moving a bit too slow, and they were forced into a firefight with that sloop. Had Sawkins been fighting the sloop a month prior, he likely would have lost. But the English refitting and restocking of his ship with supplies was a godsend. Had he been fighting them a few days earlier, he almost certainly would have won. Unfortunately, he'd undergone that fight with the Spanish that left a hole in his ranks ten men deep. At best, this fight was an even fight, and it was heated, but it was brief. As soon as Sawkins' ship was ready to sail, it did. He evaded the hunter, as probably a superior sailor in these waters, and gave the warship the slip, and sailed away into the open ocean. Now, at some point during this journey, it appears that Sawkins and Harris finally found each other. It's quite possible, perhaps even likely, that Captain Harris himself sent those men to Jamaica that aided the escape of Sawkins and his men. After all, Harris chose to linger about in the South Keys while Sawkins was captured, and then arrested, and then imprisoned, and then escaped, and then fought a battle with the Spanish, and then fought another battle with the hunter. And after all that, Sawkins knew where to meet Harris. Either way, the two ships sailed south, toward the Spanish Main. Now, we don't have any record of this voyage, but it was probably uneventful. 
most of the knowledge we have about this episode of Harris and Sawkins and the Hunter and the success, well, that all comes from official reports filed in Port Royal. However, we do eventually get a narrative account of their later exploits. The next we heard from Sawkins and Harris was at the Bocas del Toro off the coast of Panama. Literally translated, that's the mouths of the bull. Now today that's a province in northwest Panama, bordering Costa Rica. That coastline there is a maze of small islands and hidden coves and secluded bays. It was, at the time, far from any Spanish settlements of note and, quote, the best place to careen our ships, by reason there is good store of turtle and manatee and fish, end quote. In short, this was a perfect hideout for pirates. Now we get to hear of Sawkins and Harris again, because here they enter into the narratives of Dampier and Wafer and Ringrose. No, I have been unable to find a reliable source on exactly where Basil Ringrose fits into this voyage. His account begins here, in the Bocas del Toro. Neither Dampier nor Wafer mention him before this meeting. He's like a ghost. Now I would assume from the little we have that he was on board the ship of Captain Harris. He'll be involved with Harris later, and, well, Harris was busy not getting caught or attacked lately, so he didn't have a lot of story to tell. The Bocas del Toro was the chosen meeting place for the fleet under Captain John Coxon, and it appears he hoped to meet Sawkins and Harris here. Both men had been intended to accompany the fleet during their raid on Portobello, but they were waylaid by the success in the Hunter. Now the fleet under Coxon met to distribute the plunder taken in Portobello. It came out to a pretty penny for everyone involved. Every one of them got a share of 100 pieces of eight at least, while the injured and the officers got a bit more. Generally, it was a reasonable haul, and the men were mostly satisfied, but Coxon took command of a Spanish brigantine during the blockade of Portobello, and ruffled more than a few feathers when it came to light that he'd claimed a wine jug containing 500 pieces of eight. The ship was a prize as well. It was a 90-ton, eight-gun ship that was among the best in the fleet. With the treasure now doled out to the men, they began careening their vessels and planning their next move. Now this might be a good place to catch up a bit. We've thrown out a lot of names and given out a lot of backstory, so before we move on, I'd like to do a roll call of everybody who could be found here at the Bocas del Toro, and a quick recap of how they got here. This is also a good place to mention that if you haven't heard last week's episode, Weeds or Hydras, you should really go give it a listen right now. Everything that happened up till now is fairly important, but I'll try and catch you up the best I can. In December 1679, a fleet of pirate vessels met at Port Morant on the east of Jamaica and held council to vote on the code. John Coxon was voted commander of his 60-ton brigantine of 8 guns and 97 men. Bartholomew Sharp was named second in command of his own brigantine of similar proportions. There was also Cornelius Essex and the great Dolphin Bark carrying about 50 men. Robert Allison captained his sloop and Thomas Maggot was in a sloop as well, each carrying about 20 men. En route to the main, they met a French buccaneer named Jean Rose, and the fleet was scattered by a storm, but they still managed to make rendezvous on the main. There, the fleet encountered two more pirate vessels. There was the French ship of Captain Lassalle, and then Edmund Cook on board his own powerful Spanish bark. That was when the fleet attacked Portobello in March 1680 and ransacked the city. They then blockaded the harbor and made their escape. Then the fleet sailed into the Bocas del Toro, where they met their friends and compatriots, Richard Sawkins and Peter Harris, each with a sizable brigantine of their own. At this point, there were perhaps 700 men assembled, and they were making plans to attack the Spanish main again, but the French captains Jean Rose and Lassalle decided instead to return to their homes. So they're out of the story. Now the fleet was ten ships strong. Captain Coxon traded up for his new 90-ton Spanish brigantine, which left his former 60-ton ship up for grabs. Now, Sharp could have claimed it. He uh, had taken part in the capturing of the prize, but he was happy with his own brigantine. So it may have gone into the hands of either Allison or Maggot, both of whom had smaller sloops under their command, but more likely it went to one of Sharp's officers. He had on board two pirates of note who will one day become famous in their own right. First, there was Edward Davis, and second, probably serving as the quartermaster on Sharp's vessel, was John Cook. 
Cook, who was no relation to Edmund Cook, took command of a ship in the Bocas del Toro, and it appears that it was Captain Coxon's old brigantine. Now something of a crew shuffle took place here, as there was a brand new ship to man, and two new ships had arrived in the fleet. Most captains in the pirate community had a core group of officers that stuck together, and average deckhands could be shuffled about easily, wherever needed. It was the petty officers, though, that shifted the most, and the crew of John Cook's brigantine had something of a dream team. There was Cook as captain, and Edward Davis as quartermaster, most likely, and then he took on board William Dampier and Lionel Wafer as well. Basil Ringrose... Well, his story is worth looking at for just a moment. His account is perhaps the best we have of this voyage. Diana and Michael Preston describe him as, quote, a civilized, educated man born in Kent who spoke fluent Latin, end quote. And he was all that, but he was more. He was christened at St. Martin in the Field in 1653. He sailed for Jamaica after his education was completed. See, he was a doctor by then, and doctors were in high demand in the West Indies. If you remember our episode introducing William Dampier, he sailed over from England with both a doctor and a surgeon. Now, neither of those men were Basil Ringrose. I mean, well, they probably weren't. You think Dampier might have mentioned that, but Ringrose's story was much the same. Jamaica was a dangerous place. Newcomers almost always came down with a bevy of tropical diseases upon arrival, and they needed doctors to care for them. Beyond that, the West Indies, and in particular Jamaica, produced and consumed huge amounts of rum. They were dealing with gout and liver failure and all of the awful complications that come from drinking basically nothing but hard liquor. And, well, Jamaica was rich. If you were a young doctor willing to relocate, you could practice your trade for a few years in Jamaica until you'd saved enough to buy a plantation or two, and then you could move back to England, buy an estate, marry well, and retire early. So Ringrose took employment at a plantation, as did almost everyone in Jamaica who wasn't a prostitute or a pirate. Now Ringrose spoke English, French, and Latin fluently. Well, on this voyage with Dampier, he would actually learn Spanish as well and act as their primary interpreter. Now, Lionel Wafer had an equally interesting story. He was just as well educated at grammar school, although he wasn't a trained physician. Instead, he was trained at sea as a surgeon. Now, in Jamaica, he had gone to work on a plantation just like Ringrose. Not just any plantation, though. Wafer's brother worked on this plantation and got way for the job, but... Well, it was the plantation of Sir Thomas Modiford, the former governor of Jamaica and the architect of much of Henry Morgan's career. And that makes my hackles rise. This voyage was quite an undertaking, and it had a number of notable men on board their many ships. I mean, okay, Morgan had Exquamelon along on his raids, who was a surgeon who hated him, but he was the only man keeping a journal for most of it. In an army of almost 2,000 men marching on Panama, only one guy bothered to, you know, write anything down. But now, on a voyage that was less than a quarter of that size, five men kept detailed accounts of what was happening. There was Dampier and Wafer and Ringrose, but then Captain Sharp and a New England man named John Cox were also keeping journals that would eventually be published. Now... If we go on to take an Occam's Razor approach, we might assume that ever since Alexander X. Quimelin had published his book and found a pretty decent amount of success, well, a number of men thought to emulate him and go on their own pirate voyages and write down what happened. But five all at the same time? And on a voyage of illegal high seas piracy that presumably was to be kept secret? I mean, that's quite a coincidence. So... I wasn't sure whether or not to talk about this, but please bear with me for a moment. I have to put on my conspiratorial tinfoil hat and take a look at this. Lionel Wafer was an educated man making a good living in a life of relative ease. He worked on the plantation of Sir Thomas Modiford as a surgeon when he was convinced to join with a buccaneer crew and go to sea. Basil Ringrose, a very well-educated and cultured man of letters and medicine, was working on a plantation of an unnamed owner when he was convinced to join with a buccaneer crew and go to sea. 
William Dampier, an educated and cultured man of letters and science, who had just recently married and bought a home in England, was convinced to join with a buccaneer crew and go to sea. Now last time I speculated wildly at not only why, but how Dampier was convinced. I came up with a fantastical tale that Henry Avery talked him into leaving his life of comfort and a loving family looking for adventure. But these are three gentlemen, men from good homes and economically comfortable backgrounds, not exactly the type of desperate men with nothing to lose that we picture running off on pirate ships. So what if, just what if, they weren't just suddenly convinced to sail with the pirates out of the blue, but they'd actually been hired to do so? Last time I said that Dampier always claimed to be off studying the local wildlife while his companions were fighting and dying for the plunder. Now, I assumed that that was a fabrication on Dampier's part. Well, it very much seems that neither Lionel Wafer nor Basil Ringrose fought either. Now, maybe they were just protecting their reputations in publication. That's entirely possible, but maybe these three men who had never swung a sword before were actually only there to write and record. Now, why would a band of cutthroat pirates bring along three soft, lily-livered boys just to write about their very illegal exploits to potentially be used against them in court? Why would the pirates let these men write that stuff down at all? What if not only those three chroniclers, but the pirates themselves had been hired to do just that? So let's rewind the clock ten years. Back in 1669, well before Captain Morgan attacked Panama, the English sent out a very well-respected naval officer to the New World. This was after the Second Anglo-Dutch War, when Lieutenant John Narborough was sent to the South Sea on a reconnaissance mission. His mission was to sail for the Straits of Magellan and explore the western coast of South America. It was a peaceful, diplomatic mission on which Narborough was to seek new opportunities for trade with the Spanish. But Diana and Michael Preston write in A Pirate of Exquisite Mind, quote, He was accompanied by a shadowy figure named Don Carlos who claimed to know the South Seas. Late in 1670, Narborough finally reached Vivaldia in the Pacific, where the Spanish appeared friendly. The tiresome Don Carlos went ashore and was arrested. Narborough's angry threats failed to secure his colleague's release, and he sailed home. And then they go on. In 1680, Don Carlos was still imprisoned. He was nearing the end of more than a decade spinning his captors a web of amazing stories, including that he was an illegitimate member of the English royal family. The Spanish finally tired of this and garroted him. End quote. Now, it was clear to the Spanish that England was very interested in the South Seas. They'd come in and taken much of the West Indies about 15 years earlier, and now it was believed that England intended to do the same in South America. They believed that in Don Carlos, they'd captured a spy working toward that very goal. And what if they were right? What if England was pursuing the goal of setting up settlements on the South Sea, what today we call the Pacific Ocean? Their legitimate attempts at diplomacy in 1669 and possibly their attempt at espionage had ended poorly. So why not turn to the one group that had successfully attacked and evaded the Spanish for decades? Why not turn to the only group that had ever successfully marched on the coast of the South Sea and survived? Why not turn to the buccaneers? Now, I want to be clear, this is all speculation. If ever any evidence of this did exist that was concrete, it was destroyed long ago. But I think it's highly plausible that there was a very real conspiracy to send pirates into Spanish territory on a reconnaissance mission. They could raid and pillage, to be sure. That was how privateers had always been paid. But their real mission was to transport three gentlemanly, educated scholars deep into Spanish lands safely and allow them to record everything they could about the land and the people they could learn, and then to bring them home. That conspiracy, if ever it existed, would have included Henry Morgan, certainly. 
possibly even Governor Carlisle, probably even the Lords of Trade, and even, just maybe, the Lord High Admiral James, Duke of York, and even his brother, King Charles II of England. If you require further circumstantial evidence, take this. After his voyage to the South Seas, Narborough served during that Third Anglo-Dutch War as second captain on board the HMS Prince. That's right, that's the flagship of the Lord High Admiral James Duke of York, and the very same ship on which a young William Dampier served. Now, if you want to go totally off the rails, check this out. His commander, the captain of the prince, was named John Cox. He was killed, reportedly, during a fierce firefight while standing very near James himself. But John Cox is the name of that New England crewman who kept a journal of the voyage as well. Now, obviously, it's a stretch to think that the captain of the flagship of the entire English fleet faked his death to join a secret pirate mission merely to learn what he could about the Spanish settlements there, a mission which his second-in-command had failed ten years prior. But wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, that would be a book worth reading. Now, if there were any truth to that conspiracy theory, it likely didn't reach all the way to James and King Charles. However, back in Modiford's days as governor, he was oftentimes carrying out orders from the highest halls of power, but doing so using unconventional and illegal means. Many of Morgan's missions started out on orders from Modiford, orders that he had received from the Lords of Trade. It wasn't uncommon for the Lords of Trade to send orders to colonial governors that merely said, get this done, without any instructions of exactly how to do so. That way, if the governor was forced to use less than scrupulous means, the higher-ups could point to their orders and claim, rightly so, that their orders never included piracy or acts of war. So I think it's possible, but still unsupported, that some elements in the Jamaican government were actually behind this raid planned by Coxon and Sharp and Sawkins. I mean, I think it's even possible that Morgan and Modiford and their clique on Jamaica hired three scholarly men, Dampier, Ringrose, and Wafer, to chronicle their experience and report back to the Lords of Trade and Whitehall. If not Morgan and Modiford, it's possible that even bigger fish orchestrated this whole affair. Think about it. Last time... I was suspicious of William Dampier's motives in waiting around on Jamaica and finally, miraculously, joining up with the one crew that was going to go join up with the pirates. What if he had actually been hired upon returning to Jamaica as a man of letters to sail on the voyage of Coxon and Sawkins and Sharp? And just earlier, I speculated on exactly how Sawkins was able to escape. Perhaps it wasn't a few ragtag pirates sent from Harris to help him escape the clutches of the Jamaican government. Perhaps it was actually an element of the Jamaican government itself. Maybe his guards weren't held at sword point, but instead were actually given orders to release Sawkins and his men. If you want to take that line of thinking further, perhaps Sawkins was actually unaware of where Coxon and his fleet could be found, which is why a Jamaican ship was sent out to collect him, bring him in under the pretense of arrest while his ship was supplied and outfitted for a major undertaking, and then sent out into the waters where it miraculously became becalmed. Sawkins was released and allowed to take back ownership of his fleet by the Jamaicans. Now this, this is complete speculation. This is entirely unsupported. It's terrible history, but it's an idea that I've been unable to get out of my head. The voyages of Morgan, our last major pirate, were tightly wound with Modi Ford and the Jamaican government, and beyond that, the English government. The voyages to come, the voyages of, say, Captain Kidd or Henry Avery, will in their own way be tightly tied to the government. Pirates were enemies of all mankind, but more than a few times in the history of the golden age of piracy, governors of English, French, Dutch, and Spanish colonies utilized pirates when 
legitimate diplomacy and acts of wars could not be used. So why not this time? Perhaps Lord Carlyle, who was a very well-respected and very talented military man, perhaps he was the one who knew enough to cover their tracks sufficiently that no evidence of this remains. However, I've gone way off track here. I've not even covered half of what I wanted to talk about, so stick a pin in that whole conspiracy idea. Now, I'll ask you to remember it, as we'll probably be revisiting it at a later date, but for now, let's move on. With that fleet assembled, and all of the crews organized and allocated, they were ready to meet in council. Once again, with the addition of those two new ships, they needed to vote on the code and to plan their next move. Once again, John Coxon was voted to lead the expedition. Now Sharp and Sawkins were made his top lieutenants, and all of the rest played out as usual. When it was time to plan their next move, though, William Dampier spoke up. When Coxon and Sharp had been blockading the port at Portobello, they'd taken a number of ships. One was carrying a trove of mail, a number of letters, and Dampier had chosen to pour over them, looking for any useful information he could find. In those letters, Dampier found mentions of that mysterious Don Carlos. Don Carlos's words had shaken the Spanish, living on the South Sea coast. His mere presence and the belief that he was an English spy on a mission to conquer their lands, well, that was deeply worrying to Spanish authorities. And, just as a side note, I mean... Charles II had a lot of illegitimate children. Who is to say that Don Carlos wasn't telling the truth on that one? But in those letters, Dampier found a pattern. The Spanish saw through the actions of the English, and in that web of fantastic tales that Don Carlos spun, the Spanish read a prophecy. The English were planning to move on their South American colonies, much as they had in Jamaica 25 years earlier, and the Spanish were not ready. No interlopers on their South Seas territory had been successful since Sir Francis Drake. Well, that is, not until Henry Morgan had marched on Panama. They were weak on the South Sea. Their fleets were underarmed and mismanaged. Their guns were hopelessly out of date and falling into disrepair. Their forts were quite literally crumbling. Their armies were non-existent just that same poorly trained militia that had lost so many times before. The force of Henry Morgan that had taken Panama was large, but it was not an army. It was not cohesive. Any proper European army should have been able to defeat them, but the Spanish did not. In those letters, William Dampier read a Spanish prophecy foreseeing their own doom. They believed that English corsairs could, quote, open a door to the South Seas, end quote, and that the Spanish would be unable to stop them. Dampier read this, and he read the many, many calls for governors to strengthen their defenses and watch their coasts carefully, and he knew that they were vulnerable. In front of the assembled captains of the fleet, in front of Coxon and Sawkins and Sharp and Essex and Maggot and Allison and Harris, he told them about this prophecy. He told them of everything he had read of Spanish weakness and of their fear of an attack. And he told them that he knew just where to attack. In much the same way that they had followed the footsteps of Henry Morgan in raiding Portobello, it was time to attack Panama. Next time we're going to follow Captains Coxon and Sawkins and Sharp and William Dampier and Basil Ringrose and Lionel Wafer as their army of pirates makes its move and for the first time sees the Pacific Ocean. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show, everybody who has left us a rating or a review, everybody who has subscribed or liked on YouTube, everybody who has recommended the show to your friends or family, and everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon, without all of you, I wouldn't be able to do this. So thank you. Special thanks to our Patreon Commodore class, Kane, Kenway, Hefei, Jennings, Two-Gun Tony, Drunken Dak, Antonio, the Pirate Nopales, Matthew the Navigator, Bull, Vertigon, Conifalinde, Rumgut, and Bootstraps Bailey.
For access to our many rewards, which include exclusive episodes, audiobook readings, and our thank you gifts such as the Pirate History Podcast map, t-shirt, and pin, go to patreon.com slash piratehistorypodcast. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.